감사합니다. Saying now streaming live on Facebook. So, hello and welcome to this third edition of Resilient Futures, our monthly Facebook uh, live with Loic Hairs, founder of Resilient Energy, where we talk about various aspects of the energy sector, focusing mainly, mainly focusing, focusing on the contribution of renewables. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about community energy. I'm going to stop there and not define community energy because I think it's a, probably a broader sector than I um, than I will do uh, credit to. Um, I'm going to let our guest Richard Watson, um, CEO of Energize Sussex Coast, um, explain community energy. I think, um, but before I do that, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about him. It's quite a long list, Richard. <laughs> um, uh, which I will read. So, um, as I said, CEO of Energize Sussex Coast, a community benefit co-op set up to tackle fuel poverty in the southeast. Founding director of Community Energy South, in um, a network of 23 community energy groups, um, which has recently launched Riding Sunbeams. That's a great name, by the way. Mm. Um, the world's first scheme to decarbonize the railways through community-owned solar. This is brilliant. Um, He's on the board also of the Schools Energy Co-op, which has installed free solar on 83 schools across England, as well as on the cloisters of Salisbury Cathedral. That's an installation job, I imagine, was <laughs> quite yeah. fun. Um, and recently won the Co-op of the Year Award. Um, he also co-founded Energize South to install, this does stop, <laughs> install solar on community and public buildings and businesses. Uh, one of the 28 co-ops in the Energy for All, Energy for All, my apologies, um, family, which has 15,000 investor members um, and has raised 9 million in the last year for community wind, solar and hydro projects. Um, the list documents long and influential involvement, Richard. Um, it also gives those of us who are not in the know a bit of an idea about the scope and potential, I think, of community energy, just, it, you know, in some of the things that you've done. But could you give us an overview of kind of your position and your perspective and what people mean when they talk about community energy? Yeah, I think that'd be really useful because I don't think a lot of people actually realise that there is such a, a large industry called community energy in, in the UK. Uh, so it'd be really good to have kind of an overview of what you mean by community energy yeah. and how it works uh, and who really benefits from it. I think that would be really good to, good, good to understand. Okay, well, look, I'll try, but um, a lot of people have differing interpretations and definitions of it. I mean, I see it as, as it's sort of come out of the 200 year old cooperative movement when, you know, um, the Rochdale pioneers decided that they would set up their own um, co ops and people were finding that, you know, their bread was being doctored or their coal was being. Uh, you know, covered in rocks. And so they decided to, communities decided to take action and grow their own food and, and sell safe, healthy food. And I think the response in energy is, is the community deciding to take action in a market that they think is broken, that hasn't really responded fast enough to the threat of climate change that isn't really doing much about the energy efficiency of our homes in the UK. You know, 25 million homes are gonna be here in 2050 and a lot of them have really low energy efficiency ratings. And then there's the real scandal of fuel poverty, energy poverty in the UK, which is one of the worst in Europe. You know, we're, one, we're the sixth richest country or whatever. And yet 30,000 people can die of living in cold homes. So there are sort of three and a half million households technically in energy poverty under the new, um, one of the new uh, ways they're describing it. Um, um, energy poverty, it's kind of, um, so I don't think a lot of people realize what fuel poverty means and fuel poverty really for a household means making a decision between either heating your home or feeding yourself, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the technical dis, uh, description is that if you have to spend 
an amount of money to heat your home that takes you into the below the poverty line, then technically you're in fuel poverty. Yeah. There are different, there used to be the 10% rule that if you're spending 10% of your income on energy, then you're fuel poor, but they, they've sort of, they keep changing the definition. And across Europe, there are lots of different de definitions. So it could be people in energy debt, for example. So you imagine during the COVID crisis, yeah. um, I think it's 16% more people are working from home. So your home energy bills are going up 25%. A lot of people might be on furlough, might be uh, earning less money. So, so that number of people in, in, in energy poverty might have risen sharply. We tend not to see that until a year later. Yeah. Um, I kind of got sidetracked into energy poverty when I was talking about community energy. But so anyway, it's, it was a response. I think most of us started setting up co-ops in order to raise money. A bit like, you know, if you want to, if you want to keep your local village shop open or your pub and you get together and you all put some money in uh, and you own it collectively, and you don't necessarily want to get uh, an income back from that, but you might get a small income. But the idea is that you collectively own a community asset together that's necessary for the community. So energy is the same. You know, generally, we're funding through community shares. We're funding free solar panels on schools, churches, public buildings, um, businesses, uh, sometimes solar parks, sometimes wind farms. And if there's any profit above what you pay to your community investors, then you put that in a community fund and you use it for um, the local community in some way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that, that, I mean, I'm going to share a screen with you because I think it's important to um, to kind of see this in the bigger context of how uh, how it's viewed across Europe, can you see that? Yep. So this is this is called this is the e yeah. citizen yes. owned electricity in 2050. So the prediction is that by 2050, 39 percent uh, of all energy that isn't owned by multinationals, governments, or, or the very largest uh, energy suppliers <clears throat> will be owned by small businesses, 23% will be owned by individual households, 1% by public buildings, and 37% by co-op. So um, that's, that's where we are in that co-op. Yeah. Right. And can I ask a question which might be uh, an aside? Yeah. I, don't think it's an aside. I, I just wondered what, um, how much of the, uh, the, the energy behind it, wrong word to use, um, comes from a political standpoint, it, kind of a taking of, you know, people taking power over their own futures. Mm -hmm. Is it, is that a main driver for you, for other people who are in the sector or is it I, I i think i think a big driver for many people is um a sense that energy like other things is is belongs to what you call the commons and it's yeah. kind of, you know it's something that should be shared equally between everybody there shouldn't be winners and losers people shouldn't be paying too much for energy any more than they should be paying too much for air, clean air or, or water. Mm -hmm. But I think there's this feeling that the democratization of energy, in other words, putting much more of it into uh, the hands of the ownership of the community is, is a good thing. And, you know, the Europeans are way ahead of us on this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can do things in a in a market that isn't regulated the way the UK market is, which actually allows them to share energy, to put solar panels on their roofs and gift the output of those panels to people who can't you know, afford their energy bills. 
and we simply can't do this because we have to go through this filter of of energy suppliers mm. and that's a very expensive you know so if if you're producing solar on your roof and most people only use about 25 percent of the solar they generate yeah. you're getting paid five pence per unit from um the market but your neighbor's actually using that electricity and they're paying 16 or 17 pence because it has to go through the distribution network and it has to go through a supplier in order to be sold to your neighbor. And it's that sense of, you know, that's not a market that's working for people. You've got solar panels on a church or a village school. um, And when it's closed in the summer or or, or just in the case of a church, often they're brilliant solar roofs. You know, you want the whole village to benefit from the power that's being generated. Mm. So, and that you can do in other countries in Europe, but you can't do in the UK. And is but that just because of... For years, we can. Sorry. Yeah. I, I think we're, um, you know, this is kind of going into the, the, the crux of the matter and, you know, where, where we're interested is resilience energy, because, um, you know, we... We look to try and enable kind of intelligence and new ways of looking at the electricity industry and uh, the electricity grid. And I think that you know, create, you know, we love the idea of energy bubbles. And I think we we talk about energy bubbles, and quite often people don't really fully understand what we talk about. And it's it's that concept of being able to use the power for you know, if if a church is using that electricity, is generating that electricity. Wouldn't it be great for the community around the church to be able to use the electricity being generated rather than it being fed onto the grid? And that's what we kind of describe as the energy bubble. And, you know, we've talked many times, Richard, about how to kind of try and bring this idea from a paper into reality. And, um, you know, it would be great if we, if we manage that. But could you just talk a little bit about, about kind of how you've financed projects to date? Because, you know, we're, I think a lot of people have, are aware of the kind of feed-in tariff from the government, and you know I, I get the feeling that a lot of community energy uh, groups and schemes have been reliant on that kind of feed-in tariff model to be able to get projects off the ground because it, you know it was, it was created for that kind of investment model, where it was reliant, a reliable income for 25 years, so that you could get financed off the back of it, and now we're kind of going into a really unknown world without that feed-in tariff and um you able to kind of explore that kind of notion a little bit more sure i'm gonna i'm gonna try it but i'm gonna share a screen as i'm um that one so um i don't know if you can see that not yet oh maybe i need to press share screen huh (laughs) right where is it share screen okay that one. I mean, this is just a a graphic. Um, Isn't there quite yet? uh, I haven't, it hasn't come up yet. Um, I wanted to give you the context of, so the scale of community energy organizations in the UK. This comes from Community Energy England. So there are 300 organizations um, generating 194 megawatts. This was in by 2019. Um, I don't know if you want to explain that, but that's 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 quite a lot of electricity. You know, Absolutely. an average solar farm would be, you know, say five megawatts. So, um, and, but there are also 39 community storage, energy storage projects. That's the stuff you're interested in, Lo. Yeah. And there's nearly a quarter of a million members engaged in energy efficiency. Uh, there's 47 low carbon transport projects that would be electric vehicle charging points, car, you know, electric vehicle sharing, car sharing. Um, there's some heat generation projects. Uh, there's a big carbon saving. There are local benefits and the sector has raised 35 million in 2019. So it's a significant sector, but it could be a lot bigger. And, and this, is what, this is what we all want to do. We want to scale this up as much as we can. But yes, the government, the government have been, what's the word? The, the whole feed-in tariff thing, which 
I think was started in Germany in 2008, came to the UK in 2010. And when they pitched the feed-in tariff, it was ridiculously high at the start, wasn't it? It was 50. It was. If you put up solar panels, you got 50 pence per, per unit of electricity. You know, the last feed-in tariff is about three pence. So, so a lot of people um, took advantage of this and very, very quickly, the, the, both the budget for the subsidy and the target that the government were aiming at was starting to, 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 to be hit. And I think it was hit relatively quickly. So what the government did was they, they reduced the tariff in very sudden bursts in 2012 and 2015. Uh, and, and luckily, the price of solar had, was going down by, I don't know, um, something like 80% over the last 10 years. And, and it's continues to go down. So it didn't particularly matter. There was, still, uh, there was still an advantage in getting this subsidy, even when it was down to a few pence. Um, and of course, now it stopped altogether. Uh, the market is now having to function subsidy free, which is happening and it's, and it's possible, but it only really works on, you know, easy. So metal roofs are easy. Um, some roofs are easier than others, but what you need is, is a site, whether it's your own house or whether it's a school that is gonna use over 50% of the energy generated and up to 80 or 90% preferably, because the price paid by the, the site owner, the, you know, the organization you're supplying the electricity to is where you make your margin. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and you own, you get, so you, you get under the export guarantee scheme, you can get around five pence for what you put in the grid and, and you can't make enough money. So when your community investors see a share prospectus, you know, they're, they're investing their money at risk. You know, these are not guaranteed investments. These are uh, community benefit societies, co-ops like us are regulated by the FCA, but you know, it's not like investing in the stock market where you get your money back, whatever. You're taking a risk and you're gambling on the energy prices for the next 20 years, of course, which you know, nobody can predict. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns there, but you know, none, of these, none of these share offers have, I mean, they're very popular. You saw how many members invest. We, you, know, you, can, you can raise a million pounds in a week on some of these share offers because there are so many people who want to invest in community. Mm -hmm. Solar. So the, the appetite for investment is, is there. The return you get is four or five percent generally, which, yep. is, which is quite high, actually. It's really not but bad. Mm. It's not bad. And, you know, in some European countries, they see it as a social investment and they only expect a return of one or two percent. So, you know, we're slightly different. So the, the trouble is you're, you're dealing with uh, a market that is putting you know, more and more renewable energy into the grid, which is closing coal-fired power stations. And here I'm, I'm not a technical expert, Loic knows all about this. So you've got this challenge to balance the, the market when you've got this extra penetration of, of renewable energy, which is a good thing, but it's, it's making electricity more expensive because of the costs of balancing the market. And, and this is where, you know, the market is going through radical changes that, that potentially Loic, you know, could explain more fully. Um, what I find really interesting is on this slide, it's pointing out the fact that you've, you know, you've saved 65,200 tonnes of CO2. And, you know, we're, we're all, at, everybody in the energy industry is kind of, well, a lot of us are focused on trying to reduce carbon emissions to hit the government's, you know, quite stretching 20, uh, 2050 net zero targets. Now, it seems you're in a situation where you are readily 
raising money for projects and having a massive impact on reducing carbon. However, it seems like, you know, it, to me, it seems like a no brainer, you know, let this community energy groups all over the UK, they're able to raise money. You know, this is a great way of, of almost decarbonizing, decarbonizing the grid. Um, what, what's the kind of blockers there, which are stopping you kind of, you know, really going to town and putting projects everywhere? Um, but there must be something which is kind of, you know, stopping you do, doing that. Um, yeah, uh, it's sometimes hard to pin it down. But if you take schools, for example, there's you, you basically in order to give someone free solar panels on their roof, they have to lease their roof to you or lease the space above the roof. And that is now often a 25 year lease. And, you know, that becomes a complex issue of, of, of you know, who does own the land if you've got a state school, you know, is it the local authority? Is it, is it someone else? So you have a very complex leasing arrangement. And actually yeah. we, now, we now use licenses in preference to leases. So getting schools to um, say yes to solar, quite often they do. They never respond to the emails because schools, as you know, are just incredibly busy and they have a core responsibility. So, you know, the idea of solar is probably more on at the top of their minds now than, than or sorry, less now, but in the last couple of years, you know, since since the warnings have come through, I think every school would say yes to solar. Um, but you've got these complexities around the, the, the leasing arrangements. You've got local authorities that um, sometimes would rather do it themselves, but then don't. Um, sometimes just, you know, block projects. You've got the Department for Education that are now saying, well, we need to approve anybody who's installing solar on one of the schools. And by the way, we're going to do it. So, you know, you're gonna have, uh, have to compete with us because we're gonna commission, you know, a national project. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it, it isn't easy. And then you have churches which make great solar roofs, but they don't use a lot of electricity and church schools can be notoriously difficult to to persuade the local uh, environment committee of, of the diocese in some dioceses and in others, you can have a champion who just uh, makes it happen. So for example, I'm gonna show you a really, uh, a really uplifting picture. I don't know if you can see that, but these are, these are the panels on Salisbury Cathedral. I'd love to see that, but I can't on, quite on yet. Top Oh, you, has it, has it come to community energy graph here? Oh, you're still on the, okay. Still on the, <laughs> well, I've, I've changed it. So you, oh, hang on. You should, you should see it. Oh, well. But here was a case where a particular deacon was very enthusiastic about it and um, wrote a blog about it, made a, made a video. Uh, and it's been, you know, it's just such an eye-catching project, this, this cathedral that took 200 years to build. And imagine, imagination catching as well. It's, it's a really kind of, it must yeah. be a forerunner, you know, it must be a big kind of, big idea you can point to. And it's inspirational is what I'm trying to say in a very roundabout yes. way. And, and this is where we need your skills, Zaini, but, uh, Jamie, because um, we need to get this story out there that look, if Salisbury Cathedral can do it and be really excited by it, then um, we can all do it. Yeah, it, it, it seems like one of the, the areas where we all need to, to, to work towards is, you know, is, is getting that, that ability to, to really be able to use renewable energy in a more intelligent way. And, you know, across Europe, we're seeing things, uh, it, you know, we've talked about it again before, peer-to-peer -peer energy networks where one house in a street is able to sell electricity to their next door neighbours. And, yeah. you know, everybody in the UK energy industry talk about peer-to-peer -peer energy as, you know, the, the, the holy Goliath, you know, everything we're working towards one day. 
but there's so many steps in, in between that need to happen to, to actually enable it. But there's actually some things you can do today and those small steps can make a big difference. So I think it's one of those things that we, you know, we're really interested in kind of pushing the boundaries of to try and, and, and make things happen. But often, you know, regulation and the model that we're trying to work with in the actual energy model in the UK kind of stops us doing a few things. But you know, it's old fashioned and restrictive. It's, it's based on a different system. Massively, you know, I think, up with the reality of how things are going. Really. Yeah, and I think you know, there's a lot of talk about smart meters and bringing data into the into the market. But you know, this we're we're still a very kind of analog industry, and I think bringing this analog industry into the 21st century and being able to start talking about things like peer-to-peer -peer energy uh, transfer is is a huge leap. But you know, I think I think on the positive side. You know, Energize Sussex Coast is a very forward thinking um, community energy group and they're willing to talk to people like Resilient Energy mm. to look at you know, what, what is next, what can we do, what boundaries can we push, how can we make this work? And I think that, you know, for me, that means that, you know, the future is looking bright. And if you look at some of the reports in the, in the industry, like the uh, National Grid Future Scenarios report, which kind of sets out how are they going to deliver this net zero grid of the future? Now there's a massive reliance on community energy because they see the results and they see how successful it is. But I think in some ways there has to be a kind of complete overview look at, across the industry to actually deliver that vision of the future. So that you're not left with Energized Sussex Coast going, well, how do we make this happen? How can we, how can we, enable communities to use the electricity and it's not down to one champion absolutely i think that this is great let's do it if we can get that kind of joined up thinking then i think we can start delivering projects which can make a real difference and then um, you know we work with uk power networks and other other partners within the energized sussex coast area to look at how we can how we can deliver these projects but you know this has to be on a kind of national national uh, level to start getting real real movement in the industry it sounds as though the government mm. is going to be relying on these small producers in the future if that that's what you the document that you mentioned the, the grid futures document so they need to enable it surely yes um, <laughs> on a broad yes. scale i i it's it's hard to tell with governments because mm. <laughs> when they reduced the feed-in tariff very dramatically in 2015, it was also when they were uh, doing deals to fund Hinkley C. Um, yes. It turned out was going to need a 30-year uh, contract, you know, where the government agreed to purchase the electricity at nine pence per kilowatt hour, which is massive. And to clarify, that is the nuclear facility at Hinkley. The nuclear facility, yeah. Okay, people don't. Renewable energy was starting to look as if it was competitive and even more competitive than nuclear and potentially with a smart grid would, would make this multi-billion pound investment look like a big mistake within a few years. Um, so, of course, anything they could do to slow down the advance of solar sort of made sense in that context. And um, they've admitted actually quite recently that they'd undervalued, um, or rather they'd overestimated the cost of solar and wind by over 50%. So in other words, they were, they were, they were kind of misconstruing the advantages of nuclear over, over solar and, and, and wind. So I think there's, a, there's an appreciation that renewable energy can in a smart grid do much more than anyone ever imagined you know we really we you know it really can uh in a in a sort of smart connected grid it really can provide uh the majority of the energy we need um but um but yeah um you know they will tend to think in at the big scale so Boris Johnson will say, well, we're going to invest 40 billion in offshore wind, you know, problem sorted. Don't mm. have to improve a single home. Nobody needs to bother about solar. We'll just generate masses of offshore wind and that will solve the problem. But again, that's taking the responsibility and the, 
you know, the democracy out of energy. It, 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 uh, um, I think it's really important that people see how much they can contribute. And even at the micro scale, there are lots of schemes now. There's the London Solar Scheme, there's the Solar Together Scheme in several counties, are trying to bulk buy solar for domestic uh, properties. So, uh, and I think people don't get this because they think the subsidy's gone and now so solar's unaffordable. And there's been a lot of sort of dodgy selling of, of, of solar over the years that sort of gives it a bad, a, a bad reputation. But you could, if you have a south or southeast or southwest facing roof, you know, you could spend a few thousand pounds, put up solar panels, borrow the money to do it if you don't have the capital at, you know, five and a half percent from organizations like Parity Trust, um, have a 15 year loan and what you would generate and save from your solar should cover the cost of the loan so in fact it's not costing you anything and then you have you have the panels up there generating and then at some point in the future the regulations are going to shift and we're going to have a, a a situation where people can start trading energy with each other and even gifting their surplus to other homes or to um and which is what they do in europe so i i think that's you know that's pot that's good that's possible so everybody should say, well, okay, what can I do? Have I got a good roof? Uh, okay, maybe not. So is there a scheme somewhere where I can buy a few panels as part of a solar park? No, there isn't in the UK because you can't make it work. But in, you know, there is in Athens and there will be in Portugal and there is in Spain. Um, so that kind of idea where, you know, even the, even the churches could do this. They could give some glebe land, have a solar park, generate the electricity and then use it for all their church buildings. Um, so yeah, the, the, the market will open, I think, when the regulations change, but there's, there's no reason to stop people uh, putting solar up now. And you know, in some cases, batteries make sense as well, not, not in every case, but in some cases. And then you've got Loic's technology, which allows you if you become a smart prosumer in, in, in a smart market, you can, you can do all kinds of things. You can plug in your EV, you know, your EV supplier will pay you for the grid services that, services that your battery, your car battery is delivering <clears throat> when you're not using it. Um, and, you know, that, that, that becomes a whole new, you know, activity for lots of people. Um, I'm concerned about the people who are disenfranchised, who are, you know, not IT literate and, and, you know, are never likely to have an electric vehicle parked in their, in their garage that, that is sort of, you know, charging their house and saving them money and feeding the grid. So we have to find, you know, we have to find ways of, of making energy, yeah, more dem democratic. And, yeah. Have you, I wonder whether it fits quite nicely into the um, uh, kind of pandemic um, effect of making people look more closely at their home communities. I wonder whether that's had any notable. Imp I mean, I know we, it's on our it's on our list to talk about the impact of COVID nineteen on the sector as, as a whole. But I just was just wondering whether I think a lot of people are very focused on their local area in a way that they haven't been. Um, in their local community, people aren't going into town to work. They're spending a lot more time with the people very closely around them. And there is a focus. There is a much, I, in, in my experience, I think there is a focus on community, um, local buying, you know, supporting your mm. local community in that way. And I wonder if that fits very nicely and neatly into um, community energy and its potential, actually. Yeah, I really, I really hope so. We're, we're starting something new. We haven't done it yet, but we're working with a company called Pilio, which has an energy dashboard. So basically, if you have a smart meter or if you want to do, do it yourself, you upload your household's profile, how much gas you're using, how much electricity you're using, how much water you're using, how many miles you're driving. And this dashboard will you know, tell you how you're doing as, as the data changes, how much carbon you're saving, what your footprint is, 
you know, how you might compare with the area. Um, and we're looking at people forming a kind of citizens energy community online as more mm -hmm. of going to be, you know, online more of the time. Um, we want people to sort of think of groups of 20 who could, who could be, a, be an energy community online where you can sort of support each other, maybe even get a bit competitive and try yeah. and reduce your carbon footprint. You know, yeah, could do this. They could say, well, we're going to be the first neighborhood or the first village or the first town to go net zero carbon, which is pretty meaningless unless you benchmark where you are now and where you want to get to. Mm -hmm. But using, you know, using a, um, a dynamic live dashboard, you can see it. Um, and so that's, that's something that's interesting because I think, you know, the Europeans certainly got it when they said that the energy transition is going to be driven not by governments but by citizens it's got to come from the grassroots it's got and there is there's an appetite there as you say people want to invest i think people yeah. are really yeah. really interested well yeah i mean that bit's exciting but but you know i i take what loic is saying um we we struggle at the level we're at to to do everything that we we want to do the ambitions we've got without having really good working partnerships with local authorities, um, for example, or with social housing providers. It's very it's very hard to do this stuff at scale, mm. uh, and and you know I don't know how that's going to change. I've got lots of sympathy with local authorities. They've had massive budget cuts, massive staff cuts. They resources to do this stuff themselves but they don't have to do it themselves and they've been really badly hit by the, the, the pandemic as well and, and you know yeah of course yeah some of my worry recently has been you know uh, in some ways renewable energy and hitting the, the carbon uh, footprint reductions has been it's not been massively high up on local authorities agendas etc and I can't help think that maybe due to the pandemic, et cetera, it might have slipped a little bit further down. Uh, you know, is, is, and that, what kind of impact is that going to have over the next few years on, on, on our programmes, et cetera? In terms of spending priorities, you mean? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I think they're committed, but then they do what local authorities always do, is they'll commission a report from an energy consultancy, consultancy that will lay out you know um every aspect of their net zero obligations and then they will um make some commit to some targets and then uh, hopefully they'll commit to to some targets and then sometimes the officers are just very keen to comply with whatever the report says yeah that, that whole process can take a year a year and a half and it costs a huge amount of money as well yeah. Mm. actually happens and and then it you know it needs money to actually do anything yeah. um so i just don't think we can wait for the sort of top down initiative or inspiration or leadership i think it's leadership, not coming from central government either whatever they might not, say not really <laughs> not really but also i think we you know we we've got to we've got to think differently here and we've got to be smart because it's easy to get sort of trapped in this silo where energy is everything. Yes, energy is a big part of the uh, pollution, the carbon dioxide that's causing climate change. But, you know, there are other really key issues like, I don't know, the recent report that we've lost 68% of, of all vertebrate species around the world. I mean, that's just massive. Um, doesn't mean we can't you know, help nature to restore the balance and some of these species can't come back, but we have to, we have to create that possibility. And then there's issues around waste and, you know, the fact we'll be short of water in the next 10 years. Um, so I think we have to sort of see energy in a holistic sense, you know, we've, we've got to see it um, as part of, you know, our connection with the landscape and, and with nature has got to be part of that. And I think renewable energy does, you know, when the sun is powering you, when, uh, when the wind is powering you, when you're, when you're part of the natural world in that way and sharing its, its generous gifts to us, then I think 
I think it 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 raises energy out of some kind of meaningless, you know, switching on a switch and yeah. a bill to a multinational. I think we we kind of got to make it our, our, you know, part of our struggle to, you know. Yeah. We're all in this together. Well, yeah, that's what that's what we say. Yeah, that's what. <laughs> I think that um, I don't want to, in some ways, we've kind of made it kind of slightly gloomy outlook. And I think that I wanted to leave, leave the kind of discussion on a more positive note. And think I think that actually, you know, the, the impact you've made in community energy is massive. And I think that, you know, it, we, we've got a lot of um, to thank for groups such as yours in the UK for, for having such an impact and reducing the carbon so much already. And I think that, you know, lots of people like yourselves are looking to, to really push the envelope and, and do something new and bring bring our the energy outlook to the next level. And I think that, you know, I, I see it as a very kind of bright outlook and I think that we're doing the right things and we're looking at things in the right way to make the impact tomorrow, but, you know, will help us get to where we want to be. So I, I wanted to kind of leave, it, leave, leave the discussion on a bit more of a positive note, thinking that, you know, we're people are doing great stuff out there and looking at different ways of doing things and you now i think that we're we're, we're on the we're, we're on we started the right path to get to where we want whether we get there in, in time or not you know that's another discussion but you know we're, we're on a path to get and we're going somewhere yeah no you're right i i i'm only pessimistic on a tuesday <laughs> <laughs> congratulations <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much for um for being part of this richard it was lovely to meet you yeah absolutely thanks for, for taking part in the, the conversation yeah. and, um you know we'll look forward to, to continuing our work together yeah definitely and there is a lot there's lots going on yeah absolutely is there anything to... um there are there are some people with us i think on facebook hello everybody yeah um, is there anything that you'd like to tell them specifically? Anything that's happening soon to look out for? Or, um, Luke, you too? I don't know if there's anything. Um, I don't know, actually. Well, uh, are, you, are you coming up to any kind of um, Green Bond launches or anything like that, Richard? Well, we're, we're doing another share launch soon for um, Energize South. So we raised uh, about £460,000. We put solar on uh, five schools and a church and a, and a business and a, and a charity building. Wow. And we've got a, a whole list of other buildings we'd like to do. We'd like to put solar on the local mosque and a, a, another church building. Um, so we're doing a crowdfunder that we're due to launch. So we're excited about the possibility that we can keep installing solar on local buildings. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them we actually still have potentially the feed-in tariff for because we pre-registered them. Yeah. Now that the government extended the scheme until next March, we have this little, you know, small window to install. Get some uh, projects in. That, so we want to get as many of those projects up. I mean, we're really interested in the stuff that you're doing. Um, and we want to talk to social housing providers about, you know, how we can you know, we can't fund individual solar households to have solar, but we could fund blocks of flats. Yeah. They also have battery storage and they also, you know, sell services to the grid. And if everybody's prepared then to, to look at a microgrid, um, then I think, you know, there are ways of doing it, but it's, co it's complex. So that stuff needs to be demonstrated and piloted. Yeah, absolutely. And if people are interested in finding out more about your kind of next bond born launch, I'm, I'm guessing they just need to go to the, um, but is it the, I was going to say Energize Sussex Coast, but it's probably not yeah, that. Yeah, go, go to our website or Energize South or yeah. there, are, there are community energy groups across the country. There are some great ones in Lewis and Brighton, you know, a couple in Kent. Um, if anybody is thinking, well, why don't we form a community energy organization then there's also support for doing that um to set something up and i know community energy england's quite um you know organized and very good at promoting different local uh, energy groups as well um yeah 
and, which, and Community Energy South are mentoring new groups in Essex and some local authorities are very supportive and you know are investing in in this concept of community energy so there's a rush to set up local groups uh, and if your town or, or city or village wants one then yeah um, you can become part of a bigger group and when you have enough projects then you can carve off into your own co-op it's quite difficult to go from ground zero to having one or two megawatts of, of solar installations, which will then support you financially. Yeah. So, but there are, there are groups, bigger groups that will kind of help you along that path. The whole point of being in a cooperative is that you cooperate. So it's a very cooperative sector. And um, yeah, we're, we're, all, we're all doing our best, but you know, so are lots of innovative companies like you um, there are some innovators in local authorities. There's someone in this group of Brighton Academy Trust schools in Hastings and Brighton, who without him, we would never have got this contract to put solar in several of their schools. So, so yeah. and they're keen to look at heat, renewable heat. So yeah, getting to net zero, we need some of these flagship yeah. buildings like schools, like churches, like big, big, big local businesses. To... And it's interesting you mentioned social housing because, um, you know, for us, you know, there's five million social housing uh, houses in the UK. Uh, I think it represents about six thousand, uh, six million tons of CO2 a year on electricity only uh, alone. Those those five million households, and uh, we were actually thinking about making our next talk next next month on kind of the social housing sector and what can happen in that sector. So. It's um it's 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 quite nice that you spoke about it, but uh, also it's it's just a it's a huge huge uh, sector in the UK, and I think that it's one of those sectors that really needs to to kind of make a difference themselves uh, to to reduce the CO2. But um, yeah. you know, it's uh it, there's many out there who are looking to do something new. So you know, again, you know, it's a, I, I'm going to bring back the positivity on a Friday. Even though it's raining outside, I'm gonna I'm gonna be positive about it. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> but um, right. I, I, it's probably a nice place to, to kind of bring it to a close, don't you think, Jane? Yeah, I think so, definitely. Yeah, I think that was really great, though. But thank you very much, Richard, for, for coming along and. My talking. pleasure. Do you want me to to exit now? I can I can stop. I'm gonna stop streaming to Facebook. So goodbye. Oh, you've both frozen on me. Bye bye, Facebook. Bye bye.